without crying on you all. Let's go to Acts. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, we're going to do like part B of the Pentecost story. And I didn't get to finish the chapter last week in Sunday school. We went ahead and skipped to chapter 3 and covered that whole chapter. But I wanted to come back and, and wrap up the rest of this Pentecost story. Last week, if you remember, just to catch you up to speed, uh, Jesus had died on the cross. He was buried in a tomb, and he rose again from the dead. And for 40 days, he was out and about, and he was mingling with the people, showing his resurrection, showing his power, and showing that he's still there uh, alive after they had buried him. And then he said, go in the upper room and I'll, I'll be back and uh, or, or the, the spirit, the promised spirit's coming. And he ascended into heaven. And then 10 days later is the day of Pentecost and the church was born and the, the, the cloven tongues of fire were hovering over the people there that were in the upper room. And they were able to go out and they were able to speak in tongues. They were able to speak in, the, the Bible mentioned like 15 plus different languages that they were able to speak. And so so-and-so is speaking this, and so-and-so is speaking this language, and they were all hearing the people speak in their own language. And it was like one of the most amazing days ever on the day of Pentecost. And, 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 and Peter gets up, and he, he starts preaching, and, and, and then we're going to come into... Um, kind of mid, mid-service, I guess you could call it, in the middle of the service. We just kind of like cut the service off that Peter was preaching last week. And, and here we are in <clears throat> verse 37, chapter 2 of Acts. It says, Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, What shall we do? Uh, maybe if I could title the message tonight under the theme, we're in a series right now called uh, It's Go Time, uh, but if I could title this one message, maybe it would be maybe this one question that they ask, what shall we do? They, they wanted to know what they did. And the Bible says that they were pricked in their heart from what they had just heard. They weren't pricked in their heart because of the phenomenon of being able to speak in other languages. That wasn't what their, their heart was pricked about. Their heart was pricked about the message that Peter was preaching. As a matter of fact, he had just got done saying in verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. You know, in, in our day, we, 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 we get to say uh, without much offense, yeah, they crucified Jesus. But Peter, he was looking people square in the eyes who had just got done crucifying Jesus 50 days earlier. I mean, he was, he was telling them straight to their face, you guys murdered Jesus. You guys killed Jesus. We get it easy right now because we don't have to look anybody in the eye that personally was crying out, crucify him, crucify him. Set Barabbas free. But they were doing that back then. And so, so he, he's, he's preaching this message. He said, no, that Jesus, he's the Lord. He's the master. He's the Christ. He's the anointed. He's the Messiah. All power is given unto him. And so he's elevating this Jesus that they had just got done rejecting so boldly and harshly and crucifying him. It says, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. You ever been convicted about something? You ever been under conviction? You know, and, and we have, we, I've been under conviction about things. And, and, and if you think about it, a lot of the times when we feel a conviction about something, uh, a conviction, you could say, what's a conviction? A conviction, a con conviction you could say, is, uh, you could say it's more than a preference. It's being convinced about something. You could, uh, you could say a, a convinced conscience, even, is a conviction. Like, you, you're feeling something that's, that's true, that needs to maybe shift or change in your life, or something that you need to hold fast to, that needs to stay in your life. There's a conviction. You're convinced about something. And typically, when we're convicted about something, uh, it, we kind of ask ourselves the same question. Well, what, what shall we do? What, do? what do I need to do about this conviction? You know what I mean? And I was just thinking, I'm not going to go along the list of all the convictions that I've felt throughout the years, but I've, I've felt convictions ab about a lot of different things. You know, a lot of you guys, even today, you might even be living out a conviction that you have in your life. You might be living it out right now. 
Uh, maybe it's something that you feel convinced about or strongly about based on your understanding of scriptures and God, and, and you have a conviction. Maybe you're even holding to it this morning. You know, and I remember different convictions that I've had throughout the years. You know, um, I felt convicted that and I was convinced that I needed to surrender my life in a ministry and plant a church. And so I, I surrendered and I did that. You know, I, I remember I remember in the years past, you know, talking to young people now. I, listen, you young people, uh, not married yet. There's a conviction that sets in when you know God and you know that you don't need to be playing with fire and 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 being with somebody that you're not married to. You need to get married. You need to make that decision and, and get married. Amen, church? Amen. Right? I mean, because it's just playing with fire. Uh, I remember convictions about, um, and I guess I should say this, maybe just in the generation we live in, a man and a woman. <laughs> when I say married, I mean like a man and a woman. And when I say that too, and let me just add, just, I'm not like going down this road, but like I am. Uh, <laughs> but it needs to be a Christian and a Christian. A Christian and a Christian, man and woman, getting married. Okay, there's a conviction there, and you follow that. Uh, I remember being convicted about the Bible version that I use, and I, I stick, I'm sticking with that the rest of my life. You know, just different convictions that you've had throughout throughout your life, right? That you that you're convinced and you're fully persuaded. Uh, you, you've like this the scriptures say, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, and the things that you know that we're supposed to have convictions. And so here they have, they're, be, they're starting to be convicted here. They're, they're hearing Peter preach this message, and, and they're hearing him exalt Jesus Christ uh, above every name, which is where he belongs. And, and they're like convicted, they're pricked in their heart, and then they said, what shall we do? What should we do about this? And then it says in verse 38, Peter said, said unto and the rest of the apostles, sorry, Peter said unto them, what? Repent. 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 Everybody say repent. Yeah. All right. You, you, don't, you don't really like hear this word much in America anymore, the, the word repent. But the thing that Peter told them to do was to repent. So they've got convictions. They're like, what do we do about this message that you're preaching, the gospel? What do we do about this? He says, easy, Repent. That word repent, you say, what does that mean? That, that word in, in its clearest form means to change your mind. It's, com it's to completely change your mind about something. Okay? The, the imagery that we get to see physically is like the, the 180. You know, you're headed this way and you're sin and you do a 180 and you, you start living for God. But even before that, the repent is to change your mind about something. And so he's talking to a bunch of people that had just got done crucifying Jesus. And he's like, repent. You know, you know, fella over there who, who was one of the ones who was crying out, crucify him. Uh, gal over there who was one of the ones that was trying to trip Jesus up with all those questions throughout the years and try to get him to, to look bad in front of everybody. You know, you over here where he was crying out, let Barabbas go free instead. You know, all the, 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 the view that you had of Jesus before that led you to want to crucify him completely change your mind about Jesus and who he is. Jesus needs to be the king. Submit to him. Look at Jesus as, as a prophet, for example, and listen to him. And, and, and look at him as the priest who gave the atonement once and for all for your sins as the perfect Lamb of God. Change your mind about Him. Repent. Let me just go out and say, um, you might need to change your mind about Jesus this morning. I don't know who's here. I don't know your thoughts. I don't know your beliefs. I don't know how you're raised. I don't know all the, the things. You know, we have convictions about bad things too, right? There might be some convictions that you hold to that aren't godly. The only way to have good Good convictions is to have a good diet of God's word regularly. And so they had just got fed a good diet of God's word and Peter's preaching, and now they have this new conviction that they're ready to do something about what shall we do. And so sometimes you need to lay your convictions down uh, and then spend some time with God and his word and then let God maybe give you a whole new set of convictions, maybe, for example. Maybe you need to repent on how you've been viewing Jesus for your whole life. 
Maybe you're only viewing Jesus based on what mom and dad told you. You know, I don't know. I've got, Brady's got a buddy. He's been trying to get to church every single week. He invites him every other day to church. He's like, Dad, he really wants to come to church. But his mom and dad say there's no way they're ever going to let him go to church. But he really wants to come, Dad. And I'm just like, man, you know, like, what do you do on some, some stuff like that? You know, so that kid's going to grow up having this view of Jesus that, that he's going to have to repent of maybe one day if he succumbs to mom and dad's leading, right? So I don't know what your background is. Your convictions need to come from the word of God, amen? And so he says, repent. And then he says, and be baptized, Right? So in this one verse, he's still preaching. This is kind of important to note that in this verse, he's still preaching. Nobody's like getting saved right in this very moment right here. It's going to come in a second. But Peter tells him to do two things, and he says they're going to receive two things. He says, you need to repent, and you need to be baptized. Every one of you. All right? Let's just pause there for a second. You need to repent, and you need to be baptized. And so we know, we understand repentance. And when you're truly repenting and you're changing your mind about Jesus and you're putting your faith in him and following him now, that's salvation. And then at salvation, we're sealed, the Bible says we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We're sanctified and set apart. We become part of a ch the children of God at salvation. And he says, he says, baptize, be baptized. And he says, every one of y'all. All right, let me preach that real quick. Just if you're saved, you need to be baptized if you've never been baptized. Let me just throw this out there. I personally, this is a conviction of mine, I don't, I can't see God leading you in your life very much as a Christian who hasn't been baptized yet. Because baptism is the first thing that He tells us to do get saved, get baptized. And if you've been putting off that for all these years, you know, honestly, I'm saying this because I love you. You can't get mad at God for not like giving you due direction in life because it's like, well, how come you didn't do the first thing he told you to do? Why would we expect more, more direction from God if we didn't do the first thing or the last thing that he told us to do? And so he says, he says, repent. He wants everybody to be saved. That's there. And then he said, you need to be baptized. Every one of y'all. And it wasn't like they were going to sit around and like watch their fruit for the next however many weeks to see if they, they're, this was going to be it. You get saved and then you get baptized, every one of you, no matter what you've done in your life. Be baptized. And, he, and he's, he's preaching this message. He's like, you know, there's remission of sins to be had here. If you, if you would repent, you could have your sins taken away. Right? And we know that, we know that the, the having your sins taken away doesn't have to do with the water that you get in because it's by the blood. It's only by the shedding of blood is the remission of sins. And so when he says here there's remission of sins to be had, it's because of the blood of Jesus. It's not because of the water he was trying to tell him to get baptized. And we're good with that. We think we know that. And then he says, he says the other thing you can have is the gift of the Holy Ghost. And again... <laughs> That's like one of the most explainable, beautiful things that a, a person can ever experience is to be a Christian and have the Holy Ghost. Now you could say, you could say this gift might have had to do with uh, them being able to speak in tongues. Those who got saved that day, been able to speak in, in tongues and be able to communicate with people in, from different nations and stuff like that. It could, I'm not going to say it's not, but we don't see anybody that got saved that this day actually go speak in tongues. Matter of fact, we, all, we actually see them get settled in, a, in, a, in Bible studies. We, we see him get settled in prayer and, and fellowship. We're going to see that in a second. But, and so that's why I want to emphasize, especially here, that the, the, this Holy Ghost is, is just the indwelling of the Holy Ghost and having, having power in your life and leading you in your life here. He says, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, to your children, to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, what's, what's the promise here? The promise is the forgiveness of sins. The promise is the Holy Ghost, right? Because that the Holy Ghost was promised to them. Then this was all coming to fruition today. He's like, if you want that promise, if you want forgiveness, if you want the remission of sins, if you want the promised Holy Ghost in your life, you need to do these things. Actually, I say these things. You need to do the, the thing. You need to be saved. But I like how even in this verse, you see it stretched out. The promise is unto who? 
you and to your children and to all that are afar off. And then it says, to even as many as the Lord God shall call. And you see it like, it's to, it, the group gets bigger and bigger. You, your children, you know, everybody afar off. And then as many as the Lord God will call. You know, that, that word uh, call stems from two different words actually put together. One is whosoever, and then the other one is, is, is summoned. Whosoever is summoned is that calling there. And we know that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God's will is that every single person will repent. Peter's preaching the message, repent. You with me? So who did God call? Okay, we got that. Verse 40, it says, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this untoward, that means wicked, generation. He wanted them to save themselves from this wicked generation. Now, you know, again, we know that when it comes to salvation, eternal life, we can't save ourselves like from our own sin. But what he was doing, what he, he was laying kind of like two options on the table, if you will. Here's the wicked generation, here's the wicked world that you live in, and here's the other option. Christ, eternal life in heaven. And I like how it says, I like how it says at the beginning that, and with many other words. I mean, he was preaching here. He was still preaching. He told him to repent. He told him to be baptized, told him about remission of sins, receiving the Holy Ghost. But he's still preaching, and he's telling them to disconnect themselves from the wicked world that they live in. And he, it's like he places those two options. And, and when he says with many other words, I don't know why, but this is like the first thing that came in, into my mind. You might think of something else. I'm like, I wonder what else he said. I don't know. When I read, I think like that. Many other words. Uh, I wish that was written down so we could see. Let me just go out on a limb, for example. I can imagine him preaching John 14. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare, you know, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there ye may be also. And so I can see Peter saying, like, listen, here you can see what you can have right now. This crummy, crooked, wicked world. You can have that. Or you can come over here and choose Jesus. And then let me tell you what Jesus taught us back a little while ago, he taught us that in his father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, he would have told us. He went to prepare a place for us. He went to prepare a place for us. And, and he's going to come again and receive us unto himself. Don't you want that instead? And I love giving this illustration because if, if you came to my house, you'd probably shake your head at how many like machetes and guns and like all that stuff that I have at my house. It's just a little over the top. But, but when I think of prepare a place, uh, I, the kind of the imagery is if you're walking through the uh, jungle, and you've heard me share this before, if you're walking through this thick, uh, encum or cumbered pathway, and somebody just goes through and just like makes this path where there was no path, and makes this way, kind of like he did at the Red Sea. He made a way when there was no way. When it says he goes to prepare a place, he literally prepared a place where there was no way that any human could ever open that road up, but Jesus could. And he prepared a place, and he opened, he opened up the pathway for you to be able to come to him and have eternal life in heaven. And I can just see, like, Peter preaching some of those things. It says, with many other words, did he testify and exhort? So he's trying to encourage them to, guys, wake up. You were wrong about Jesus. I didn't mean like you guys, like all you guys were like, oh, my preacher. <laughs> Maybe I did, it, did that for one of you, but no, I'm just saying. <laughs> he's trying to get him to wake up. Like, you know, seriously, this, he's worth it. He's worth it. Oh, God's leading me to say this. Ty, I'm going to share something. Uh, <clears throat> when, when Ty's late wife, Sam, passed away, and I was doing her celebration of life, of course, he told me, you share the gospel, but he said, if you could do something, please don't say, get saved because Sam would want you to get saved. He said, please don't say that. I'll never forget it. He said, Please tell them to get saved because Jesus is worth it. And that, that has always stuck with me. 
And never from that day forward have I ever said, get saved because so-and-so would want you to get saved. We should because He's worth it. He prepared the way for you to have eternal life. Amen? He's worth it. And so he's preaching, he's exhorting, he's trying to encourage these people, save yourselves. And then in verse 41, it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That's a lot of people. 3,000, could you imagine just at one time, 3,000 people accepting Christ and being baptized right on the spot? How beautiful of a thing. I just Let's highlight a few things, right? It says, then they that gladly received. All right? They did it gladly. You say, what, what did they receive? That word received, it means they, they heard out the message, and they approved, in a sense, what he was saying, and they subscribed to it by faith. They believed what he was saying. And so that is the moment of salvation. They heard it. They believed it. They approved of that message in their heart, and they gladly were saved. They gladly received the gospel message. And again, if you read that, he had preached, like, interwove the gospel several times through that, that whole preaching message. And so they did it gladly. Amen. I, wanna, I just want to highlight gladly because it's going to come back into play in a minute. But man, if anything should make us glad, it's like, you know, eternal life, <laughs> having forgiveness of sins, having your slate wiped clean. And that should put a smile on your face. And I'm not saying everybody that has to get saved is just with a smile on their face, right? Somebody, some people do it weeping. Some people do it. Some people do it. This way, right? It's as long as they received it gladly. And so because they gladly received the word and were saved there, then they got baptized. On the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And again, man, those guys' arms had to have been inspired to fall off. All these people baptizing people left and right, left and right. And then I just kind of want to zero in on verse 42 a little bit as well. These people that got saved and baptized, it, and you've heard me say this, this, this is the starting point. Salvation and then when you get baptized, that's the starting point. That's not the finish line. That's when you get started. You're now in the family of God, and now it's time to do something for the Lord. And so I love their hunger here. It says, and they did what? Continued steadfastly in the apostles' what? Doctrine and fellowship and in breaking bread and in prayers. They had a hunger for more than just their conversion. And somebody who's truly converted will show you that they're hungry for more. Salvation, though it's enough, like, it's not enough. I want more. You know what I mean? Like, I need more of Jesus. I, need, I want to learn more of Him. I need to get in my Bible. I want to pray. Like, I want to spend time with God. It says they continued steadfastly. They continued, and it was steadfastly, and it was in the apostles' what? Doctrine. Where do you think the apostles got their doctrine from? What they get to do for the last several years? Listen and learn. The Holy Ghost just opened their eyes and their hearts up to the understanding of the Scriptures just recently. And now they have something to teach. Okay? And I, I, it drives me crazy. Some of, these, some of these churches that I hear, it's just like, yeah, the pastor like, decided not to preach today because God didn't like, give them anything. So they just prayed and went home. Like, what? Like, isn't there something to, to teach? Isn't there something to encourage people about? Isn't there something from God's Word to be able to share? You ain't been reading, dude. You've not been praying. They were hungry to get more, and, and those that had the doctrine had something to teach, and they were sharing it. And so there was this regular, continual um, appetite for more doctrine and for more of God's Word, and for more of Him. And, and you see that. And guys, that's, that's what I love about, about meeting regularly, like we do, like meeting every week and, and through the middle of the week, because it just shows that there's a hunger for more. We Yes, we do worship and all these things. Yes, we sing His praises, but there's a hunger for more. We want more of God. We want more of God's Word. 
and they were teaching, and they were listening, and they were fellowshipping with each other. You know, it's a beautiful thing when God's people like, like each other. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing when you can just sit down with somebody and enjoy a meal with a brother or sister in Christ. You might not agree with every single thing that they think, and vice versa. But goodness, if we're, if we're one in Christ, and we're unified in the body of Christ, we should be able to sit down and have a meal with any brother or sister in Christ and be able to find joy in it. Amen? If you can't, you got something wrong with you. Because Jesus died for them, just like he did for you. Amen? And so it's just a beautiful thing. They, were enjoying, they were enjoyed fellowship with each other. They enjoyed meals. They were breaking bread with each other. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And so it wasn't just this moment. It wasn't just this preaching moment. It wasn't just like this, this beautiful moment that tongues were involved here. Then there were many signs and wonders done, and we, we read in the next chapter during Sunday school, they, they, for example, they healed a lame man that was lame from his mother's womb. There was just some things that were going on. Uh, to prove the power of God was in on this, and, and many mighty things were being done. It says fear came on everybody because of the signs and wonders that were done by the apostles. By the apostles. And I, again, I just want to emphasize one more thing. You know, people like to chase after being able to do all these like supernatural things for God, but, but you see the apostles emphasize here doing that. Everyone else, you see their emphasis in studying the Bible and praying together and fellowshipping. You see that emphasis. It's very clear. That's what they were doing. That's where their heart went. They wanted to know more. They wanted to know more of God. They wanted to encourage each other. And, and not only that, they wanted to be a blessing in their community. They wanted to be blessing in the community of the, the believers. And so in verse 44, it said, And all that believed were together and had all things common. That means they shared everything. Back here in this moment, and they shared everything. Verse 45 says, And they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. I mean, they, it, was, it wasn't about who could have the most. It was like, make sure everybody has enough kind of mentality. Make sure everybody's getting by here. Make sure everybody's got what they need. And, and, and I, I like this because it's, 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 it's almost, uh, and I, I've preached this before, and this, with this kind of mindset, if you're willing to like sell everything and, and do what God wants you to do, it's kind of like the surrendered life in a sense. You know, and I remember challenging everybody one Sunday a long time ago, get out a check, and a lot of you guys don't use checks anymore, get out a check, write it to Jesus Christ, sign it, and leave it blank. That, that's what like a surrendered life is like. You write the blank check to him. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll sell whatever you need me to sell. I'll give whatever you need me to give so everybody can have what they need. Are we picking up on the heart that they had? Like I really want to just emphasize the heart that they had. Verse 46, and they did what? Continue. Do you see that again? They were continuing before, and now they're still continuing. They're continuing daily with what? One accord. You remember that's kind of how it all started in the upper room. They were gathered together in one accord. They're still in one accord in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house. They did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So I just love this. They're still continuing. They're still hungry for more, they're, and they're still glad. You see that? Like, they're still glad. Their gladness hadn't worn off yet. Their gladness didn't even wear off after they sold everything they had. They were still glad because they were serving the Lord. They, they did it with gladness of heart, praising and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved the Lord began to add to the church. As, you know, we're, we're like, the train is just now going now. I mean, when, when I say it's like go time, in a series called, that, called Go Time, the train, it's, it's, it's taken off now. All right? We're, we're getting ready to see just people going and preaching on mission 
doing this for God here, going here and doing this for God here. And it, there's just, it's just constant, nonstop. And then they'll split up and they'll spread out even further and they'll go further and they'll come back and then they'll go even further, right? And you see God pushing these people and taking these people all over the world to take that gospel message that every person so desperately needs to the ends of the earth. In Sunday school, for example, I'll end with the last verse in chapter 3, for example. In, in Sunday school, uh, we talked about how they healed this lame man. And then they preached. Everybody came around, and he got an, another opportunity to preach publicly. And the last thing he gives, at uh, Acts 3, 26, he said, Unto you first, so he's talking to the Jews mainly here, Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to what? bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And I'm, I'm just here to echo that sentiment this morning to that Jesus came and he died to bless you and save you and wipe away all of your iniquities. Amen? Let's bow our heads and let's pray. God, we come to you today. Lord, I pray that if there's any here that has not quite yet had their sins washed away, had their sins uh, removed by the blood of the Lord, Lord. God, I pray that you would make today be the day that they would submit to you, that they would surrender their life to you, even now. I'm going to ask you a question that I ask every week with every head bowed and every eye closed. There's nobody looking around. And I'm not going to call you out or embarrass you or anything. I just want to know who I'm talking to when I ask this question. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Kevin, I have no idea that if I died today, I'd go to heaven, but I sure would like to know. I'd like to be saved right here, right even now where I sit. Would you just look at me just for a second until I see you? Just look at me until I see you. Nobody at all like that. Not at all. You need to be saved today. What appears in preaching to a bunch of brothers and sisters in Christ. Before we leave this place, I just want to challenge you. Now, where's your heart? You know, you've got convictions in your life. Maybe God convicted you of something today. Maybe God convicted you of something today that needs to shift in your life. Maybe you need to ask yourself that same question. What shall we do? What should I do about it? When John the Baptist was telling people they needed to show fruit, and he was really challenging their faith, they asked, what shall we do? When Paul was in Philippi and he was getting ready to break out of that prison, and the jailer was terrified, and he said, what shall I do to be saved? There's just something that's getting worked on in some way, so maybe you're being worked on in some specific way. Maybe we're just going to open up the altar, and we'll take a few minutes this morning. Maybe you just need to ask God that simple question.